Okay, so to start off this morning, we're going to have Dr. Cullen talk to us about infective endocarditis. Um, super important talk. There's always several questions on the, on the examination about this. It's also super important, obviously, for our clinical practices as we're continuing to see people with infections. So let's do a few pretest questions. This is an 85-year-old man uh, who underwent TAVR with a sapien prosthesis for aortic stenosis two years ago. The patient is scheduled for cystoscopy for painless hematuria. He has a soft, short systolic injection murmur on examination with crisp clo closing sound and no diastolic murmurs. He has no allergies. What is the appropriate regimen for infective endocarditis prophylaxis prior to his cystoscopy? Is it amoxicillin, cephalexin, clindamycin, ceftrioxone, or he doesn't actually need prophylaxis? Okay, a little bimodal distribution here. A 45-year-old man, five years status post-mechanical AVR for bicuspid aortic regurgitation presents with four days of malaise and a fever. His primary provider detects a diastolic murmur. His echo shows a normal prosthesis leaflet motion with moderate to severe aortic regurgitation. Three years ago, his echo showed only trivial aortic regurgitation. His TEE confirms the moderate to severe periprosthetic AR, but shows no vegetations or abscesses. The blood cultures remain negative. His exam demonstrates no embolic or immunologic sequelae. In addition to empiric antibiotic therapy, what is the next appropriate step? PET imaging, cardiac MRI, repeat transthoracic echo in two days, or repeat the transesophageal echo in two weeks. Okay. The next one is a 50-year-old woman, three years status post-mechanical MVR, presenting with fever and malaise. She's hospitalized after blood cultures grow Virden's group streptococci twice. Her TEE shows a small vegetation on the mechanical mitral valve. She's on appropriate antibiotics. On the third hospital day, she develops transient left-sided visual loss that resolves after seven minutes. Her MRI shows a small focus of occipital ischemia. She is on warfarin with a therapeutic INR. How do you manage her anticoagulation? Continue her warfarin uninterrupted. Stop the warfarin and start aspirin 81 milligrams daily. Stop the warfarin and bridge her with IV unfractionated heparin. Stop the warfarin and give 2.5 milligrams of oral vitamin K or just stop the warfarin. All right. And the last one is a 75-year-old woman undergoing pacemaker implantation for complete heart block two years ago. She's got fever and malaise. She's also got uh, Virden strep, uh, and a TEE reveals a small vegetation on the aortic valve with minimal aortic regurgitation and normal device leads. Exam of the device pocket is normal. The patient receives antibiotics. Her symptoms revolve, resolve, and her blood culture is also clear. How should you manage her pacemaker? Should we complete the antibiotics and retain the device if blood cultures remain negative? Do we need to completely remove the device generator and leads? Do we need to exchange the device generator but retain the leads or perform serial transesophageal echo surveillance for new device lead vegetations? What's the best way to manage her pacemaker? All right, well, Mike, it looks like you have educational opportunities for each of those questions. Uh, Mike does a really fantastic job with this uh, lecture on infective endocarditis, so pay attention to the next 35 or so minutes. 
uh, for your practice and your board prep. Mike, take it away. All right. Thank you, Dr. Amon, for the introduction. It is a pleasure to be here speaking with you this morning about infective endocarditis. I have no financial disclosures to report. We have four learning objectives this morning. The first is to apply current guidelines for prophylaxis to prevent infective endocarditis. The second is to describe the diagnosis and management of a patient with suspected or known endocarditis. The third is to recognize complications of endocarditis and select appropriate treatment strategies, including the need for and timing of surgical intervention. And the last and the fourth and last learning objective is to discuss the epidemiology and management of cardiovascular implantable electronic device infections. We're going to pr approach those learning objectives with this outline. We'll begin by talking about infective endocarditis prophylaxis. We will move next to a discussion of infective endocarditis diagnosis, infective endocarditis complications, and then infective endocarditis management. We will move on to cardiovascular device infections and then close with a summary and some pearls for the boards. Let's dive into the first section on infective endocarditis prophylaxis. When I think about infective endocarditis prophylaxis, I like to think about three questions. Number one, which patients require infective endocarditis prophylaxis? Number two, which procedures require infective endocarditis prophylaxis? And number three, which drugs should be given for infective endocarditis prophylaxis? In terms of the patients, we're going to want to give infective endocarditis prophylaxis to the patients at the highest risk for complications should they develop infective endocarditis. These are going to be patients with prosthetic cardiac valves, including trans catheter valves. These are going to be patients with prosthetic material used for valvular repair like annuloplasty rings as you see here. These are going to be patients with prior infective endocarditis and transplant recipients with valvulopathy def defined as anything more than mild regurgitation. Now I'm going to add to this list in addition to prosthetic cardiac valves devices. Watchman implants, left atrial appendage occlusion devices, um, clips used for transcatheter mitral and tricuspid edge-to-edge -edge repair do necessitate ongoing infective endocarditis prophylaxis. A number of patients with congenital heart disease are also at high risk for complications and deserve infective endocarditis prophylaxis. These are going to be patients with unrepaired cyanotic lesions, patients with cyanotic lesions and palliative shunts or conduits, patients with a recent repair less than six months ago with prosthetic material in their heart, or patients with repaired lesions, even if it was more than six months ago, with residual deficits. Now, if you don't know what some of these conditions are, that's fine. Dr. Warnes is going to give us a tour to force on congenital heart disease this afternoon. On the flip side, who does not require infective endocarditis? Patients with mitral valve prolapse with, even if they have regurgitation, even if they have thickened leaflets, do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Patients with acquired valvular disease, like Dr. Nishimura is going to talk about later this morning, do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Patients with prior rheumatic fever, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. A number of patients with uncorrected but relatively low-risk congenital defects also do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. For example, patients with bicuspid aortic valves, patients with PDAs, patients with VSDs, or certain types of atrial septal defects do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. We can add to this list patients with aortic coarctation as well. All right, so that covers the patients that require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Let's move next to the procedures that necessitate infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Any dental procedure involving manipulation of the gingival tissue or root of the teeth or perforation of the oral mucosa is going to necessitate infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Essentially, this is any cleaning, extraction, or root canal. Any um, incision into active an active skin or soft tissue infection necessitates infective endocarditis prophylaxis, and any incision or biopsy in the respiratory tract requires prophylaxis. So if a patient has a tonsillectomy, an adenoidectomy, or a bronchoscopy with biopsy, they merit infective endocarditis prophylaxis. <laughs> 
On the reverse side, which patients, I'm sorry, which procedures do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis? Simple dental injections or x-rays, no prophylaxis necessary. Placement or adjustment of orthodontic appliances, no prophylaxis necessary. Minor bleeding from trauma to the lips or oral mucosa, no prophylaxis necessary. Shedding of deciduous teeth, so if the teeth, tooth fairy comes, no prophylaxis necessary. Tooth fairies visited my house a few times in the last few months. Obviously, no endocarditis prophylaxis necessary there. A bronchoscopy without biopsy and GI or GU procedures without active infection do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. We've talked about the patients, we've talked about the procedures, let's talk next about the drugs that you should give for infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Your go-to drug for infective endocarditis prophylaxis is going to be amoxicillin. Okay, if the patient has a beta-lactam allergy that precludes use of amoxicillin, clindamycin is going to be your backup. Regardless of which drug you choose, all of the drugs on this list are going to cover virulent group strep. All of them should be given as a single dose 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. What I tell my patients is to take their amoxicillin or clindamycin on the way out the door to their dentist's office. Let's recap infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Which patients require infective endocarditis prophylaxis? These are going to be patients at the highest risk for adverse outcomes. Remember, a number of low and moderate risk patients do not require prophylaxis. Most dental procedures require infective endocarditis. GI or GU procedures without active infection do not require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Amoxicillin is going to be your go-to drug in terms of the uh, drugs to give all of them are going to cover virulent and group strep. They should be given as a single dose 30 to 60 minutes before the procedure. Now, this is all well and good, but what is really the best infective endocarditis prophylaxis? All the things that we teach our kids to do, right? It's regular professional dental care. It's twice daily brushing, once daily flossing, okay? What you tell your kindergartner to do to maintain dental hygiene is what we also need to tell our patients to do. So maintenance of dental hygiene is critical in patients at risk for infective endocarditis. You really need to emphasize that with your patients. That completes our discussion of infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Let's move next to the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Now, in order to make a diagnosis of infective endocarditis, you first need to suspect infective endocarditis. When do you want to suspect infective endocarditis? You're going to want to suspect infective endocarditis in patients with risk factors. These are going to be things like established valvular disease, prosthetic valves, IV drug use, congenital heart disease, or an immunocompromised state. If a patient like this presents with an unexplained fever of at least 38 degrees Celsius for more than 48 hours, or evidence of new valvular regurgitation, then your red flags need to go up for infective endocarditis. You're probably going to want to put a patient like this in the hospital, and then you need to start your evaluation. What are you going to do? You're going to get blood cultures, two to three sets, ideally six hours apart. Very important, get the blood cultures before initiation of antibiotics. You're going to get your transthoracic echocardiogram, and then the guidelines recommend a number of circumstances where a transesophageal echocardiogram is indicated. These are going to include situations where the transthoracic echocardiogram may be diagnostic, where you may suspect complications, where the patient um, may have an intracardiac lead, if the patient has staph aureus, enterococcus, or fungal bacteremia, or if the patient has a valvular prosthesis and a persistent fever. Those are all clear indications for a transesophageal echocardiogram. In reality, though, I think if the clinical suspicion is high enough, it's helpful to get both the transthoracic echocardiogram and a transesophageal echocardiogram because they really provide complementary sources of information. Guidelines say that cardiac CT is useful if there's concern for perivalvular involvement. Oftentimes, these are helpful for surgical planning as well. And I would like to highlight the role of FTG PET CT. So the guidelines give a new Class 2A recommendation as of the 2021 valve guidelines for patients to undergo um, FTG PET CT if there's concern for possible prosthetic valve endocarditis. FTG PET CT can provide some very useful diagnostic information in this situation.
So you've got new blood cultures, you've got new imaging, now you have to make a diagnosis. How are you going to make a diagnosis of infective endocarditis? Well, you're going to want to apply the modified Duke criteria. And I always find this confusing. We're going to try to simplify the Duke criteria. So when you apply the Duke criteria, you can put patients into one of four buckets. We can get definite infective endocarditis by pathological criteria, definite infective endocarditis by clinical criteria, possible infective endocarditis by clinical criteria, or this phenomenon called rejected infective endocarditis. And we're going to talk about those one by one. Let's start with definite infective endocarditis by pathological criteria. So the guidelines will say that definite infective endocarditis by pathological criteria um, can occur when we have microorganisms on an excised vegetation or abscess specimen, or if we have a vegetation or abscess showing active endocarditis like we see in this pathological sample here. Now, I'm not a pathologist. I'm sure many of you watching are not pathologists. The way I like to think about this is if the pathologist calls me and says, hey, we see bugs under the scope, okay, that is a cardiologist definition of definite infective endocarditis by pathological criteria bugs under the scope. It gets a little more complicated when we start to think about the clinical criteria. So we have definite infective endocarditis by clinical criteria and possible infective endocarditis by clinical criteria. Okay, we're going to break this down. We're going to try to make it as simple as we can. So in order to have definite infective endocarditis by clinical criteria, patient needs to have two major criteria, one major and three minor criteria, or five minor criteria. In order to have possible infective endocarditis by clinical criteria, they have to have one major and one minor or three minor criteria. So the next question is what are these major and minor criteria? Let's talk about them one at a time. We'll start with the major criteria, three major criteria to recognize. Number one, multiple positive blood cultures for organisms that typically cause infective endocarditis. Number two, a single positive blood culture for Coxiella brunetti is enough to constitute a major clinical criteria. And number three, evidence of endocardial involvement. What is evidence of endocardial involvement? Well, it's new, moderate, or greater regurgitation defined on imaging or evidence on imaging of vegetation, abscess, or valvular dehiscence. This is an example of a vegetation. The guidelines define a vegetation as an oscillating intracardiac mass on the valve or supporting structure. If you see this on your imaging, this constitutes endocardite, endocardial involvement and counts as one of your major clinical criteria. The other cl major clinical criteria then, as we just talked about, is the microbiological evidence. Okay, so that covers the major clinical criteria. Let's move next to the minor clinical criteria. So five of them to recognize. Number one, a clinical predisposition. Okay, what's a clinical predisposition? These are all of the risk factors that we talked about earlier. Number two, fever, at least 38 degrees Celsius without an alternative explanation. Number three, blood culture or serological evidence of active infection that doesn't meet major criteria. So this might be one positive blood culture for a typical organism or maybe multiple positive blood cultures, but it's not a typical organism. Okay. Now, I would like to note that a single positive culture for coag negative staph does not constitute a minor clinical criteria that is more likely to be a contaminant. And then we have the vascular phenomenon and the immunological phenomenon. And any one of these phenomenon can constitute a minor clinical criteria. What are the vascular phenomenon? Here's an example of some vascular phenomenon. So these are conjunctival hemorrhages on the left, subconjunctival hemorrhages on the right. These are end or these represent end organ vasculitis in the eyes due to the circulating bacteremia that occurs with infective endocarditis. This is an, one example of a vascular phenomenon. We have other examples of vascular phenomenon. So Janeway lesions represent a vascular phenomenon. Janeway lesions are these painless lesions on the palms and the soles. They're painless. They don't hurt. Okay. They appear as these erythematous or hemorrhagic macules. They are caused by septic emboli to the skin with subsequent dermal infarction. Splinter hemorrhages are an example of a vascular phenomenon. Splinter hemorrhages are these non-blanching lesions in the nail beds. Now, some of you may be looking at your fingers right now and saying, oh my gosh, do I have infective endocarditis because I have splinter hemorrhages? Well, if you see these splinter hemorrhages more distally, these are more likely to represent traumatic splinter hemorrhages. You could see these just after you know heavy labor where maybe there's some minor trauma to the, the nail tips. 
these distal splinter hemorrhages are not going to be as concerning. What becomes more concerning is when we see them more proximal in the nail bed. These are more likely to represent embolic events, which would constitute a vascular phenomenon. Patients can develop mycotic aneurysms. What are mycotic aneurysms? They are an infection of the blood vessel wall leading to vascular dilatation, and those mycotic aneurysms can rupture leading to cerebral hemorrhage, which with definite adverse neurological consequences. Patients with infective endocarditis can embolize to essentially any vascular territory. Here's a patient with a renal infarct on this CT scan due to um, infective endocarditis. Here's a patient with a splenic infarct on this excised pathological specimen due to infective endocarditis. So that covers the vascular phenomenon. What are the immunological phenomena? We're going to talk about a few of them here. The first that you should recognize is Oslo's nodes, okay? Oslo's nodes are these painful, painful nodules on the fingers and toes. They are caused by immune complex deposition leading to a necrotizing vasculitis in the tips of the digits. The way I like to remember this is Oslo equals ouch, okay? Unlike Janeway lesions, Oslo nodes are painful. And then we have Roth spots. Okay. Roth spots are these exudative lesions in the retina. They have pale centers. They are caused by a localized immune-mediated vas immune vasculitis. The way I like to think about this is Roth equals retina. Okay. So we've talked about our vascular phenomenon. We've talked about our immunological phenomenon. Let's recap the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. So remember, modified Duke criteria puts you into four one of four buckets. We've got definite infective endocarditis by pathological criteria, that's bugs under the scope. We've got definite infective endocarditis by clinical criteria, that's going to be two major, one major and three minor, or all five minor. We've got possible infective endocarditis by clinical criteria, that's going to be one major and one minor, or three minor. And then we have this phenomenon called rejected infective endocarditis. What is rejected infective endocarditis? Well, if you find an alternative diagnosis, if the patient gets better with less than four days of antibiotics, or if you take a look under the microscope and you don't see pathological evidence of endocarditis with less than four days of antibiotics, then the patient doesn't have infective endocarditis. Then you have to go looking for alternative diagnoses. That completes our discussion of infective endocarditis diagnosis. Let's move next to complications of infective endocarditis um, infective endocarditis. We're going to put complications into one of three buckets. We've got local complications, systemic complications, and immunologic complications. Okay. Valvular destruction is an example of a local complication. Here we see a patient with a perforated native aortic valve precipitating severe aortic regurgitation. This can lead to congestive heart failure. We can also see patients develop perivalvular extension. This is another local complication. Here we see a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve, which we can appreciate on the short axis image. The leaflets are quite thickened, and this patient has globular thickening of the posterior aortic root consistent with abscess and perivalvular extension. Now, if these, this perivalvular extension expands into the conduction system. It can precipitate conduction abnormalities like high-grade AV block. In terms of systemic complications, patient can, patients can develop metastatic spread of their infection to other organ systems. Here we see a patient with vertebral osteomyelitis in the setting of infective endocarditis. And as we already talked about, patients can embolize to essentially any vascular territory. Here we see a patient with infarcts in multiple vascular territories in their brain due to infective endocarditis. Four immunological complications to recognize. We've already talked about two of them. So Roth spots in the retina, Osler's nodes, ouch. Those are also considered immunological complications. And then we have patients can develop glomerular nephritis and a positive rheumatoid factor as, as immunological complications of infective endocarditis. I would add that if a patient has glomerular nephritis or a positive rheumatoid factor, that can also constitute an immunological phenomenon for the purposes of making your diagnosis by the Duke criteria. Let's recap infective endocarditis complications. Local complications, we can have valve destruction, which can precipitate heart failure. Perivalvular extension can precipitate heart block, as we see in this tracing here. In terms of systemic complications, patients with infective endocarditis can embolize to essentially any vascular territory or develop distant metastatic spread of their infection. 
in terms of immunological complications for you to recognize. We've talked about the Osler's nodes, ouch, Roth spots, retina. Patients can also develop glomerular nephritis and an abnormal rheumatoid factor. Moving right along, we've covered infective endocarditis prophylaxis, we've covered diagnosis, we've covered complications. Let's move to the management of infective endocarditis. We're going to break management into two components. We're going to talk about medical management, and then we're going to talk about surgical management. Okay. A keystone aspect of medical management of infective endocarditis is antimicrobial therapy. I would encourage you to never make these decisions about antimicrobial therapy for infective endocarditis in isolation. Do that in conjunction with your infectious disease colleagues, but you should be familiar with the basic principles. Okay, The major principles of antimicrobial therapy and infective endocarditis include prolonged parenteral and bactericidal therapy. Okay, these are prolonged four to six plus week courses of antibiotics. I give an IV designed to kill the bugs. The big three bugs that we're going to target when we think about empiric antibiotic therapy for infective endocarditis are all going to be gram positive cocci. Okay, we're going to want to target viridin group strep, staph species, and enterococcus species. So if you don't have a bug identified and you're trying to work with your ID colleagues to develop an antimicrobial regimen, these are the bugs that you need to think about. This, these are some representative antibiotic treatment regimens for infective endocarditis. This is not meant to be memorized. It's also not meant to be comprehensive, but I do use it to illustrate a few key principles. First of all, patients, all, first of all, all of these represent prolonged parenteral therapy. Okay, four to six weeks of IV antibiotics. Okay, viridin group strep. If a patient has viridin group strep endocarditis, they may be able to get away with a slightly shorter course of antibiotics than if they have staph or enterococcus endocarditis. And if a patient has prosthetic valve endocarditis, they're going to require six weeks of antibiotic therapy. Some patients with native valve endocarditis, we may be able to get away with four weeks of antibiotic therapy. So those are some of the distinctions I want to highlight. From a big picture perspective, obviously any granular decisions about infective endocarditis antibiotics need to be made in conjunction with an infectious disease specialist. Let's move next to a discussion of anticoagulation and infective endocarditis. Why do we need to understand how to manage anticoagulation? Well, in order, we want to make sure we prevent adverse neurological complications in infective endocarditis. How do neurological complications develop? Well, we've already talked about the fact that patients with endocarditis may develop septic embolism to the head. That can precipitate cerebral ischemia, and that cerebral ischemia can lead to hemorrhagic transformation with potentially disastrous neurological complications, as we see in this patient with a large intracerebral hemorrhage. Okay, the key is to prevent this hemorrhagic transformation from occurring in any patient with evidence of a CNS ischemic event. What do the guidelines say about this? Well, the guidelines will say that we should temporarily discontinue anticoagulation in patients with infective endocarditis and cerebral embolism or stroke, regardless of other indications for anticoagulation. Okay temporarily discontinue anticoagulation if you have a CNS event, regardless of other indications for anticoagulation, and we should not start aspirin or other antiplatelet agents as adjunctive therapy in infective endocarditis. Okay? In case that isn't clear, let me make it explicitly clear. Stop the warfarin. If you have a patient with infective endocarditis and they have a cerebral ischemic event, Regardless of their indication for anticoagulation, you need to stop the warfarin, stop their anticoagulation. Let's talk next about surgical management of infective endocarditis. Before diving into this too deep, I want to make the point that discussions about when to send patients to the operating room for infective endocarditis are complex. You should not be making them in isolation. You need to involve a multidisciplinary team. So make sure you're taking care of these patients at a center where you have easy access to not only cardiology, cardiac surgery, infectious disease, neurology, and potentially cardiac anesthesiology. That being said, you should be familiar with the patients that need to go to the operating room sooner rather than later. What do I mean by sooner rather than later? Well, I mean during the initial hospitalization before they complete their antibiotics. The guidelines are pretty clear about who these patients are. So patients with valve dysfunction and heart failure, 
patients with left-sided staph aureus who fungal endocarditis, patients with heart block, abscess or destruction, and patients with persistent bacteremia for at least five days all have a class one indication for early operation during their initial hospitalization before they complete their antibiotics. Patients with recurrent emboli or persistent vegetation despite antibiotics have a class 2A indication for early surgery. And then patients with large mobile vegetations over 10 millimeters in length or patients with other indications for surgery who have had a recent stroke without extensive hemorrhage or other damage have 2B indications for operations. Okay. A few other caveats on surgical management. If a patient has had an extensive stroke or hemorrhage, we need to wait four weeks. We don't want that hemorrhage to get worse when we anticoagulate the patient in the setting of cardiopulmonary bypass. If a patient has relapsing prosthetic valve endocarditis where you can't clear the blood cultures, you clear them and they relapse and you clear them and they relapse, you need to make sure the blood, the bacteremia isn't coming from an alternative source. But if you've done that and the patient continues to relapse, the patient needs to the patient needs an operation, but the timing is somewhat unclear. If the patient has evidence of endocarditis and an intracardiac device is involved, the device needs to come out. If they have a device present and they have endocarditis and the leads in the pocket are not clearly involved, but the endocarditis is from a staph, staph warrior, so a fungal organism, the device needs to come out. If the patient's going to the operating room for infective endocarditis. Even if the device isn't clearly involved, the device needs to come out. And what the guidelines have done, because this is so important, is they've actually elevated this to a class one recommendation in the most recent guidelines. So any patient with a device and definite infective endocarditis, the device needs to come out, okay? Any patient with infective endocard, definite infective endocarditis and an intracardiac device, the device needs to come out regardless of whether or not the device is clearly involved. So what I would leave you with is that when in doubt, take it out, okay? When in doubt, take it out if a patient has a device in the setting of infective endocarditis. Let's recap infective endocarditis management. In terms of medical management, we're going to want to use prolonged parenteral targeted antibiotics. We're going to want to withhold anticoagulation in any patient that has a CNS event. In terms of surgical management, we're going to want to operate early if the patient has any evidence of complications. And we're going to want to remove any intracardiac devices in setting of definite infective endocarditis. Now, what I have just talked about was mainly addressing left-sided endocarditis. I want to mention a brief aside on right-sided endocarditis. Unfortunately, we're seeing more and more of this, particularly in the setting of the opioid epidemic. When you see right-sided endocarditis, think about dirty needles, okay? Right-sided endocarditis is staph aureus plus IV drug use until proven otherwise, okay? How are we going to manage right-sided endocarditis? We're going to break it into medical management and surgical management. In terms of medical management, patients with uncomplicated staph aureus right-sided endocarditis can generally be treated with a beta-lactam for two to six weeks. If patients have MRSA, they bought themselves six weeks of vancomycin. Who needs an operation for right-sided endocarditis? Okay, stepping back a bit, patients who receive medical management have about an 85% response rate. So they typically respond well, but in certain situations we need to operate. So who needs an operation for infective endocarditis? Patients with right-sided heart failure and severe tricuspid regurgitation that aren't responding to um, medical management require an operation. Patients with a prolonged infection with a resistant to fungal organism are going to need to go to the operating room. And patients who have a large vegetation that are embolizing to their lungs despite treatment are going to require surgical intervention. If we do need to intervene surgically, we want to repair rather than replace the tricuspid valve, if at all possible. That concludes our discussion of infective endocarditis. Let's move to a discussion of cardiovascular device infections. We're going to break cardiovascular device infections into two sections. We'll begin by talking about epidemiology, and then we'll talk about management of device infections. What do we know about the epidemiology of device infections? Well, we know they occur in up to 5% of devices. The incidence has been increasing over time as we implant more devices into sicker and sicker patients. The risk is going to be higher with ICDs compared to pacemakers. Why is that? ICDs have more complex hardware. The mortality is not great. 5% at 30 days up to 15% at one year. So these patients generally don't do well, which underscores the need to evaluate and manage them appropriately. Risk factors for device infections include immunosuppression, 
comorbid conditions like diabetes, chronic kidney disease, use of anticoagulants, which can precipitate bleeding around the device site, which can be a nidus for infection. Less experienced operators are more prone to device infections. More hardware equals higher risk of device infections. And not receiving pre-procedure prophylaxis at the time of device implantation is also a risk factor. Now, these are all well and good, but by far the biggest risk factor for device infection that you need to recognize is device manipulation, okay? Recent device manipulation is going to be the single biggest risk factor for device infection. That's why we want to try to limit situations where we have to open device pockets or manipulate the leads as much as possible. What bugs cause infective, I'm sorry, what bugs cause device infections? This is data from a retrospective review of nearly 200 device infections here at Mayo Clinic. It's a little bit of an older study, but it's still cited in more recent literature today. And what this study cited is that the majority of device infections are going to be caused by either coag negative staph, methicillin susceptible staph aureus, or MRSA. And this distribution were about 70, 75% of the infections are going to be caused by coag negative staph or staph or this hasn't really changed over the last 20 to 30 years. What we have seen is that an, the prevalence of MRSA has been increasing in more recent series. I've seen 10, 15, maybe even 20%. But the overall distribution that you need to recognize is that 70, 75% of device infections, coag negative staph or staph aureus. Right. So that concludes our discussion of device infection epidemiology. How do we manage device infections? Well, the first thing that we have to do is suspect a device infection. When do we suspect a device infection? Well, if we have a patient with a device who presents with fever, leukocytosis, maybe an elevated sed rate, if they have erythema, swelling, or erosion at the generator site, that needs to raise our red flags that, hey, this patient could have a device infection. We do our history, we do our physical, we interrogate the device, we get blood cultures, we get them on antibiotics, and if we can establish establish a device infection in conjunction with our ID colleagues, the device needs to come out, okay? We're going to want to completely remove the device in any instance of an established device infection. Now, question always comes up, when might the device remain? Okay, if the patient just has a superficial infection at their incision site without evidence of pocket involvement, you may need to you may be able to retain the device. If the patient with the device has bacteremia alone and meets all of these criteria, if they're clinically stable, you identify an alternative source for the bacteremia. If they don't have any evidence of lead involvement on TEE, if they don't have any involvement at the pocket, the device hasn't been recently manipulated, there's no valve involvement, no evidence of endocarditis, and the bacteremia clears with antibiotics, then you might be able to keep the device in place. Okay? But these situations may not be as frequent as you think. So if you need to take the device out, then, then the next question becomes, when can you reimplant the device? Well, the first question you actually have to ask yourself is, does the patient need a new device? Because up to 25% of the time, the initial indication for device placement may no longer exist. The patient may actually not need a new device. That makes things a little bit easier. If the patient does need a new device, you want to put it in at a new site, preferably on the contralateral side, and we need to wait for blood cultures to clear. Okay, we want to wait 72 hours after the initial device comes out. If the valves are involved, if the patient has endocarditis, we may need to wait up to 14 days before implanting the new device. Let's recap cardiovascular device infections in terms of epidemiology. Remember, device manipulation is going to be the strongest risk factor. Staph species are going to be the most common bugs. In terms of management, any established device infection requires device removal. And before just popping a new device in, we have to ask ourselves, does this patient actually need a new device? Because that might not always be the case. We have covered a lot of ground. We have talked about infective endocarditis prophylaxis, diagnosis, complications and management, okay? We've also covered cardiovascular device infections. I'm going to close with a summary here and some pearls for the board. So let's go out on this. Four pearls for the boards. Number one, only patients at the highest risk of complications from infective endocarditis are going to require prophylaxis. Number two, Remember, the major clinical criteria for the diagnosis of infective endocarditis are going to be multiple positive blood cultures for organisms that typically cause infective endocarditis and echocardiographic evidence of endocardial involvement. Number three, patients with infective endocarditis and embolic CNS events should 
old anticoagulation. And number four, intracardiac device infections are, require complete removal of the device, including the generator and leads. So with that, I would like to thank you for your time and attention this morning. I'd be happy to take it. We'll move next to the questions. Fantastic, Mike. Thank you very much. Come on over and let's go back over these uh, questions that we posed prior to your lecture and see how much better they do now. The first one is this 85-year-old man who had a TAVR with a sapien prosthesis two years ago. He's scheduled for a cysto for painless hematuria. He has a soft, short, early systolic ejection murmur on exam with crisp closing sound and no diastolic murmurs. He has no allergies. What is the appropriate regimen uh, for him? 92%. All right. I think there was that's, a little lift there. That's a little lift. Yeah, we'll see there. Um, so two-thirds got it right the first time. Yeah. 90% got it right this time. Yeah. So um, common scenario comes up. The fact that he has a tab. So a few things about this. The fact that he has a tab doesn't matter. So yep. any prosthetic valve. Mm -hmm. requires infective endocarditis prophylaxis. What we've also seen the new guidelines get a little bit more granular about is the fact that um, all prosthetic material used for valve repair, so not only annuloplasty rings, mm -hmm. but also um, the clips, like the mitra clip. Yep. The patient has one of those. They require infective endocarditis prophylaxis. Um, what the guidelines don't really specify is what to do with these left atrial appendage occlusion devices. Yep. Um, I don't think that would be tested on boards. I, I intentionally yep. did not put something like that in the question here. But I think asking, just asking around yep. our practices generally to give prophylaxis for those situations. One of the people watching asked, does a pacemaker or defibrillator count as an implanted no. device? So you, you don't prophylax for, for Correct. those? Correct. Exactly. Okay. Um, stents, no prophylaxis necessary. Pacers, okay. no prophylaxis necessary. All right. Excellent. The, the, the other thing I want to mention is, um, and I, I, I tried to show the, the photo of this, but really dental hygiene is the, the key to yep. infective endocarditis prophylaxis. So anytime before a patient goes through valve surgery, you need to make sure their dental hygiene is up to date. They don't have any festering infections. We've actually protocolized that in, in our valve patients. And then after valve surgery, every six months, they need to be mm -hmm. going to the dentist, mm -hmm. brushing twice a day, flossing mm -hmm. once a day. All the stuff I tell my five and seven-year-old. <laughs> right. So, so the key to this question is while the man has a prosthetic valve, it's yeah. his procedure that makes his prophylaxis not necessary because this was a cystoscopy. Correct. Exactly. Yes. yes. So, yeah. so yes, he would be someone who's, if he's going to the dentist, he requires right. prophylaxis. Okay. If he's undergoing, say, a respiratory tract procedure, mm -hmm. so a bronch with mm -hmm. biopsy, he's going to require prophylaxis. But GI and GU procedures, very important to recognize that they don't require prophylaxis. Yep. Awesome. Okay. Cystoscopy, colonoscopy, those things like that, no prophylaxis. All right. The next one is a 45-year-old man, five-year status post-mechanical AVR for a bicuspid valve. He's got four days of not feeling well with a fever of 38. He's got a diastolic murmur. His echo shows moderate to severe AR with normal leaflet motion. Three years prior, his echo didn't show, it showed trivial AR. His TE confirms that he's got a, a big perivalvular leak with no vegetation or abscess. His blood cultures remain negative. His exam demonstrates no embolic or immunologic sequelae. In addition to empiric antibiotic therapy, what is the next appropriate step for him? Do we need a PET scan, an MRI, repeat his echo in two days, or repeat his TEE in two weeks? I think we had a nice lift though. We did, yep. Okay. So, so this is actually new in the 2021 guidelines. They've elevated the role of um, FDG PET CT. Um, so if we talk about this scenario, so this patient has possible infective endocarditis. So this is where the understanding the Duke criteria can be mm -hmm. helpful. So he's got a fever. So he's got, um, so he's got a fever and an AVR. Okay, those are gonna be two minor criteria. And then he's got this aortic regurgitation, which is a major criteria. So he's got one major and two minor. So if he had one major and three minor, that would be definite infective mm -hmm. endocarditis. But he's got one major and two minor, so he's in the possible, not definite range. So, but you still need to treat those patients as infective endocarditis. So you put them in the hospital, you get your cultures, you get your imaging, you get your antibiotics on board. 
And part of the imaging in this patient is 18 FDG PET. And what the guidelines will say is that if you have this possible infective endocarditis prophylaxis, particularly if you have a prosthetic valve, mm -hmm. FDG PET can be quite helpful because it can look for inflammation on the, around the valve that echo can't, can't see. Got it. Okay. And, you know, um, in terms of the other options here, cardiac MRI, that's not going to be helpful because there's going to be too much shadowing from the, from the prosthesis to see anything. Repeating a transthoracic echocardiogram or a TEE, those are not unreasonable choices, but the timing is not quite right. So we will often, if the diagnosis is uncertain, do additional imaging in the sort of that five to seven day window. Got it. So I think a TTE too soon, in 48 hours is too soon, a TEE in two weeks is too late. And if you're doing repeat echocardiography, are you doing transthoracic at all or are you getting TE for these cases? So it depends. Um, I think both have their place. Um, and that's the reason I sort of, you know, I think in our practice, if there's a, a high enough suspicion for endocarditis, patients are generally getting both because think about a TEE is going to be really good at looking at sort of the mitral valve, at looking at the mitral aortic intervalvular fibrosis, looking at the posterior aspect of the aortic annulus and the aortic root, whereas a transthoracic echocardiogram is going to give you more information on ventricular size, ventricular function, severity of aortic regurgitation. So I think they provide complementary pieces of information. Imaging. And you could make an argument that if you're going to repeat an echo, maybe you, you get both of them, particularly if one of them is inconclusive. Okay. All right. The next question is a 50-year-old woman, three years status post mechanical MVR, fever and malaise. She's hospitalized after blood cultures grow viridan strep uh, twice. Her TE shows a small vegetation on the valve. She receives appropriate antibiotics. On the third hospital day, she develops transient left-sided visual loss that resolves after seven minutes. The MRI shows a small focus of occipital ischemia. She is on warfarin with an INR of 2.9. How do you manage her anticoagulation? Is it continue the warfarin? Is it stop the warfarin and switch to aspirin? Is it stop the warfarin and switch to IV unfractionated heparin? Is it stop the warfarin and reverse her with vitamin K or just simply stop the warfarin? Hopefully we have a nice lift here. You tend to emphasize this one. <laughs> the 96 point font gives it away. Yeah. All right. So good, good, good. I think people recognize that you need to stop the warfarin. And this always creates a lot of angst. Okay. Mm -hmm. They say, oh my gosh, mechanical mitral valve. How are we going to, she's going to clot her valve. Right. Um, yeah, it's anxiety provoking, okay? But the risk of, of, of valve complications is actually going to be relatively low to the risk of bleeding in your head. I've had people at this course come up to me after I've given, when we actually had people at the course, yep. um, come up to me after this presentation and say, you know, we had a patient on our hospital service just like this. She had an event. We didn't stop the anticholy. She bled into her head and she died, mm -hmm. okay? You don't want patients to bleed into their head. The, you need... So then the question comes up, okay, you stop the anticoagulation. What do you do about the, the mechanical mitral valve or the mechanical aortic prosthesis? The risk is relatively low, maybe 5%, maybe less of developing complications. You need to examine these patients really well each day. Yeah. So you're listening for the, the crisp mechanical click. You want to continue to hear that on a day-to-day basis. Obviously, you're going to follow them symptomatically. You don't necessarily need to do serial echoes in these yeah. people to look at their mechanical prosthesis. Um, but you watch them for 14 days, you make sure they're better neurologically, and then you get them back on their anticoagulation. Excellent. All right. A 75 year underwent pacemaker implantation for complete heart block two years ago. She presents with, presents with fever and malaise. Her blood cultures are positive for strep. Her TE reveals small vegetation on the aortic valve with minimal regurgitation and normal device leads. The examiner of the device pocket is normal. She receives antibiotics. Her symptoms resolve and her blood culture is clear. How should we manage the pacemaker? Is it one, complete the antibiotics and retain the device if the blood cultures remain negative? Is it two, completely remove the generator and leads? Is it three, exchange the generator but leave the leads? Or is it four, just do serial TEE surveillance for new device lead vegetations? completely remove the generator and leads. I think that generated a nice lift as well. Yep. So, so you need to get the whole system out. You need to get the whole system out. And this, the guidelines have actually accelerated this, the level of recommendation here. So previously it was, um, 
only really bad actors. So um, Enterococcus, Staph aureus, fungal organisms. So strep viridans, if you're just going to treat it medically, may not have elevated up to the threshold of removing the device. But this is pretty clear, not only in the ACC AHA guidelines, but in the HRS has a consensus statement on indications for uh, um, lead extraction. And in both um, documents, any established infective endocarditis necessitates device removal, even if the leads are not involved. So you need to take the whole device out regardless of the bug, okay? Um, regardless of whether or not you're gonna treat that endocarditis medically or surgically, okay? Now, so that's the way you should practice and that's the way you should answer these questions on boards. I have heard people say recently that, well, if you have a prosthetic valve endocarditis mm -hmm. and a device and you're gonna treat the prosthetic valve endocarditis medically, then you're never gonna be able to clear, you're never gonna be, the, the same process is affecting both the prosthetic mm -hmm. valve and the device lead. So you're not gonna clear both. They're probably gonna need long-term antibiotics, you know, suppression. Mm -hmm. So maybe you just keep the device in. Okay, we can have that discussion on a case-by-case -case basis, but for the purposes of your boards, established endocarditis, the device comes out. Does it matter? Do you treat a subcutaneous ICD system differently? Those are going to be easier to remove. Okay. So, but, so you still take it out? It, no, if it was just underneath the skin mm -hmm. and they don't have any, any leads involved, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, not as clear on that what to okay. do, but I, I, I'd have a low threshold for taking it out because it's going to be a lot easier to put back in. Yep. All right. So final pour, pearls from you are stop the warfarin. <laughs> Keep the teeth clean. Keep the teeth clean. Keep the teeth clean. Did I mention stop the warfarin? He's mentioned stop the warfarin. And then device, in, when in doubt, take it out. Take it out. When All in right. doubt, take it out for intracardiac device. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Mike.